to being an activist, I met this guy. He always gave me advice. He always told me the right thing. He always helped out the little guy. And then when we all went on siesta for about 10 years, when the liberals were in power, he continued. He continued fighting the good fight. He's a lawyer for civil rights. He has a hundred pending court cases in regards to education, freedom of speech, and freedom of the right to choose in the school of your, the school of your choice. And after this, please go up to him and say, how can I help you financially, Brent? How can I help you, just help you in general? Civil rights lawyer, Maitre, Brent Tyler. Hi folks, thank you very much for those kind words, Jimmy. And, uh, I'd like to thank Howard for inviting me to speak today. Uh, after I accepted his invitation, there were some of my friends and, and colleagues that said, well, well, why are you going to show up at, at, at that event? Uh, I mean, you know, Howard's, Howard's left Quebec for Ontario, and uh, uh, you know, why does he have any credibility to talk about language issues? And I responded by saying, well, I think language issues in Quebec should concern all Canadians, and it doesn't matter where you live. And so I'm more than happy to be here at Howard's invitation. I'm also happy to share the podium with uh, Peter Goldring, the MP for uh, Edmonton East, who'll be uh, uh, up here after me. Uh, I wish we had dozens of MPs uh, just like him here to talk to you today. So whatever else people can say about Howard, one thing I admire and respect about him is that you know where he stands when it comes to freedom and equality. Freedom and equality are more than just abstract legal notions. They're forces in human history. And I don't think anyone understands that better than Howard Galganoff. Now, if ethnocentric nationalism in Quebec is to be defeated, the only way we're going to do it is to talk about freedom and equality. And when we look at ethnocentric nationalism, what is it? It's this connection between blood and soil. It's this idea that one group of people somehow has greater rights, more influence, than other people. It's like the, the animal farm. You know, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. So that's the first biggest threat to human rights in, in the province of Quebec. What is the second biggest threat? Well, folks, I think the second biggest threat are those people that do nothing to fight ethnocentric nationalism. And the fact that you're here today means that, that you believe in freedom and equality, and, and if they were, I wish we could clone this group uh, and have it on every street corner in Quebec. Now, since the election of PQ last September, there have been a lot of incidents, and we've all heard about them in the media. We have, you know, ticket takers in the metro that, that won't speak English, even though they're perfectly capable of doing so. Tourists being harassed for speaking English, English on the street. And the list goes on and on. But there's one, one particular incident which occurred just recently that I think can give us a lot of lessons. 17-year-old girl decides that if she wants to speak English during the, a break at her workplace, that she should be able to. And she, she has... She has the wherewithal to record the conversation that she has with her employer. Very smart girl, very courageous. And then instead of calling her lawyer, which would have been perhaps a good thing, she goes to the media and it goes viral. Nothing bothers ethnocentric nationalists more than to have a big light shone on them. Okay? I've said this before and I'll say it again, they're like rats in a cellar. When you shine a big light on them, they scurry away. Now, The, if you listen to the, the video, uh, or the audio tape, rather, you know, the manager was saying, c'est la loi. You know, th this is the law. Of course, it's not the law, but we shouldn't be surprised that, that, that many Quebecers are imbued with this idea. They're, they're, they've been marinating in it for years, that somehow any space given to a language other than French is bad, and somehow takes away uh, from, from, from the French language. It's the same underlying assumption that we see time and time again. Language policy is a zero-sum game. Whatever space is given to French takes away from other languages.
And, and we both, we all know that that is not the case. But I see all these signs about Bill 14. You know, the debate about Bill 14 is an important one. Uh, and, and we can all agree that it's an ugly, discriminatory piece of legislation. The problem with the debate, as I see it though, is that there are many people in the industry that say, well, if, keep the current law. Just don't accept Bill 14, and we're, and we're happy with the current law. Well, let me tell you that. I gather we're not happy with the current law. The problem is it has the same underlying assumptions. The same underlying assumptions. And so, it, I, I liken it to a slippery slope. You know how a slippery slope works. Bill 14 is two-thirds of the way down the slippery slope. The current law is one-third of the way down the slope. The problem is, as soon as you're a foot down that slope, you're at the bottom. And so, so when we're opposing Bill 14, let's just make it clear that, yes, we oppose Bill 14, but we have serious problems with the current law. There are currently dozens of prosecutions that are pending in front of the Court of Quebec. We're going to a trial, a month-long trial in February, uh, and we're arguing the Charter of Rights, the right to freedom of expression, the right to equality, the right not to be discriminated against on the basis of language. And what's central to that case is this, what I call the big lie, this idea that somehow the French language is so vulnerable in the province of Quebec that it justifies infringing the rights and freedoms of people that speak another language. And that has been accepted, it's become axiomatic, it's now it's seemingly impossible to contest that. We're going to contest it in court. We have and the one thing that one thing my clients have asked, and I, I guess I would call it Megan's lesson. Megan's lesson. What is Megan's lesson? If you see something that you don't agree with, if you see something that's unfair, don't sit there and take it. Denounce it. Fight it with every fiber of your being. And so, make, I'll call it Megan's lesson. I think she should be nominated for the Order of Canada this year. As a result of these cases, they're going to go to trial in, in, in February of next year. And they're going to take seven years to go to the Supreme Court. Now, in the meantime, if a merchant wants to keep his or her sign for reasons of principle, because there's no good business reason